6L80 General Motors 2015 Chevy 1500 pickup truck famous for torque converter failures and uh, this one had a pan uh, that had a whole lot of metal in it um, gonna take it apart here and see what it looks like on the inside hi so what we got here is the GM 6L80 which is found in oh came out in 2006 and um, I'm not sure when they stopped production but it wasn't too long ago it's now become a very popular transmission in transmission shops so I'm gonna take it apart here show you what I do on a rebuild um, uh, the, the, the stuff we use, the kits we use, and, and uh, perhaps some machining as well if we find that's what it needs. So here we go. I don't know if you can see this that well, but that magnet being really fuzzy like that is that's a bad sign that something's coming apart. And um, most likely it's a torque converter because these are the, the converters in these are just work to death so yeah I mean it's got metal all all over the place what happens is the uh, that metallic that's continually generated uh, from a failure clogs up the filter which starves a pump and creates that whining noise that you might hear. Got to take that out first or you'll end up breaking the valve body or breaking the Tecum unit rather. If you don't work on these every day, you might want to lay the bolts out to keep them organized, but after a little while, it becomes second nature on where they go. little parts like the roll pins will go through the mesh on my basket as it goes in the cleaning machine and, and they'll get lost. So those little things I set out on the on the rag here. Drum here is the um, contains the one, two, three, four, and the three, five R clutches, and uh, it's been known to crack. So we have a special tool that uh, we can use to air check. The 
and this small drum is the contains the four, five, six clutches. There are some special tools required, like you need a really big pair of snap ring pliers. Because that's a really big snap ring. the drum that contains the two six clutches and the low reverse clutches comes out. And then the planetary planetary gear comes out. You want to check these. Sometimes they start getting metallic through them and can uh, cause uh, minor impact damage to the gears which in that case, you got to replace them. And then the ring gear and the output shaft. And here's the tail housing. This is a goes to a four four wheel drive truck, so a transfer case with bolt to the back. Sometimes they pop right out. Sometimes they take a little. Uh, urging to get them out. But now after this case drips it's ready to go in the cleaning machine and be ready to uh, put back together. So here we are taking apart the pump and we'll, we'll see just how bad it is inside whether it needs machining or not. Surprisingly, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be with, with a clogged filter and uh, a lot of metal in the pan. There's the pump rotor and pump rings. And all the pump vanes. I like to throw these parts in the basket to get washed as well. <clears throat> now if you're new to the 6L80, well, as, as with any transmission, you'd You'd want to keep everything organized since we. This is a very common transmission. We. Uh, I can throw these parts all in a basket and not have any questions later on on where anything goes. Uh. I don't know if you can how well you can see it, but this uh, scoring over here was where metallic had gotten trapped under the pump vanes as they were going around and um, I think it's just bad enough that we're gonna need to 
machine the bell and put a fresh surface on it. Because otherwise, if it uh, if it doesn't have a smooth surface, the pump will won't uh, operate as efficiently as it should. So we can turn this over and let it drain and move on to another sub-assembly. But before we go away from the pump here, the pressure regulator valve is one thing uh, that's a common point of wear in these. That valve lives right in here, this part of the pump. Whoops. It looks like it's starting, just starting to wear on the anodizing and that's pretty sad because this truck only has 32,000 miles on it. General Motors, um, being the truck seven years old, they they weren't willing to uh, do anything for the guy. But I think he tried. <laughs> so here we are. Before I clean it, I wanted to give you another real close-up of the, uh, the magnet and, and all that fuzz on there. And that is... Uh, Definitely uh, extensive amount, um, quite excessive. Um, you know, a lot of people, they might look at this and say, yeah, that's normal accumulation, but it's really not. It's uh, This is excessive accumulation when the magnet's looking hairy like that. Really fuzzy. You know, it's uh, when you get that type of metallic buildup where it's standing up like a porcupine, uh, like porcupine quills, that's uh, definitely a bad sign and uh, uh, you know, a definite indication that there is something going wrong, a, me a mechanical failure happening inside. Next, I, I like to work on the one, two, three, four, three, five R drum. And the first thing we're going to do with that is uh, use the air checking tool. This tool is made by Richard Wardell down in, uh, I think it's Cartersville, Georgia. Nice guy. And makes some nice stuff as well. What we want to check for is that the uh, circuit seal, that there's no cracks. This is right around this area. Uh, I don't know how well the video is going to show it, but uh, right around this area here is pretty prone to cracking. And I don't know if it's just fatigue that causes it or pressure spikes. Uh, that can uh, put a little too much stress and flex on the on the the metal because they everything is built so light, just borderline functional. That's when you know it's sealed well, that it holds, and then when you take the gun away. It uh, blows back at you. Yeah, 
and the 3.5R has a little bleed hole. Right there. But yeah, that drum holds real well. If it wasn't for the converter failing, this drum could have probably went 150,000 miles. Even though I think the drum would last a lot longer, uh, it still needs to come apart and get that metallic debris that's been circulating throughout the unit. Uh, just take everything apart, replace the rubber, uh, O-rings and, and seals and bonded pistons. Uh, these, you know, even though um, the rubber would, would, again, probably go a long way, it uh, they, they tend to get embedded with the metallic and also the metallic in there acts as an abrasive accelerates the wear of all the components that uh, that it comes in contact with yeah these clutches uh, they're, they're they're not bad I think I think they will clean up and uh, and continue to live a normal life. Saves the customer a little bit of money as well. Clutches, like anything else, is not cheap anymore. The next drum will take apart is the what's called the 456 and again I don't I don't see any damage on this so a lot of times uh, when the filter gets clogged these clutches will be the first ones to get burnt up but uh, they they look pretty good you know I uh, I wouldn't be opposed to going back with them. So with the uh, clutch spring compressor, we'll take the drum apart. Gotta grab pliers that go in the correct direction for an external snap ring. Okay, so now that the snap ring's gone, the piston can come out. That's a balanced piston. And then there's a spring. And, and here is. ply piston for the 456 clutches and uh, yeah, I mean there you can see the metallic all around this edge here that gets embedded which uh, when it gets embedded in there it just starts acting as abrasive like sandpaper uh, on the inside of the drum and a, a steel drum is not that affected by it but an aluminum drum uh, tends to be they tend to get worn out and sometimes need replacing because uh, getting worn where the uh, where the seals or bonded pistons ride another another thing to pay attention to on the 456 drum is the little bushing that's in here and that bushing not only does it help keep the shafts and other drums in in uh, a center line axis it uh, it also acts to seal in compensator feed oil and uh, you know we, we test it with uh, as you can see this is the pilot that that goes into that bushing and uh, and this is this is in good shape it's uh, it's really not going to get any better than that even with a new bushing 
So the foot press here for the clutch spring compressor, uh, we can change it around where instead of using a, a lever, it will pull straight down and uh, the diameter of this drum won't, won't really fit in there that well. Take out the snap ring. Pour out the excess uh, oil in there. A lot of times I'll just use a 90 degree pick like this, if you can, if you can see it, and pull up on this piston here. And if you look close, you might see just a well, I guess it's just more muck from that uh, metallic getting in there and uh, m making a mess of things, but uh, the piston feels good. Now we have another snap ring. Holds together the lower portion here. Sometimes getting a snap ring out of a down in a recessed area can can be a little bit of a chore. It doesn't always cooperate right away. But one way to get this lower piston out is just like that. Good solid surface, hit it square, and uh, everything t seems to come out. Yeah, just more metallic muck that gets in there and causes uh, problems over time. Luckily, the converter was coming apart fast enough that it created other issues before causing damage to these parts. So here's the uh, inside of the 123435R drum, or input drum. Um, but if you look real close, you can see how there's metallic building up here in all these serrations between the between the where the uh, splines of the clutch steels go and uh, and this is not bad we get a lot of units that are really loaded up in there and it takes a lot of scraping and elbow grease to to get everything clean because if you don't you're going to end up with metallic in the pan and even though everything's running good you'll say hmm You'll question if everything's really running good and and be wor like, where's that metal coming from? But it's just wash back from crevices like that. And so we want to keep that to a minimum by cleaning everything up really well. So this is the lower piston from the 123435R drum. And if you look real close, you can see that it is getting a little scored on this aluminum from the metallic uh, that's been circulating throughout for who knows how many miles. And uh, so what we'll have to do, and I'll show you later, um, 
after we wash it, after it comes out of the cleaning machine, um, we take either 600 or 800 grit paper. Some people use Scotch-Brite, uh, but I, I tend to prefer the, the sandpaper. I think it smooths it out a little better. The Scotch-Brite can, well, as they say, under a microscope, it will leave more of a jagged surface, which is why uh, they call them scuff pads. So here we have the 2.6 clutches and the low reverse clutches. Let's go ahead and take apart this drum. And like the others, these 2.6 clutches look pretty good. Let's check the low reverse. Yeah, they're looking a little shabby, but I've seen worse. Now they take a, I don't know if you could see it with the, without the light glaring off it at all, but now they're kind of dark in the center and you know, some clutches just have that look, but some of these ones, and especially as you get towards the center of the pack, it tends to get a little, a little darker, which, you know, they, uh, means they might have been slipping a little bit or just well just through normal use um, I don't think I've ever seen a pair or a set of uh, low reverse clutches that that didn't have this whether it was 30 something thousand miles or or 150 thousand miles yeah these this set might get replaced. Well, let's take apart this uh, two six side of the drum. It's got a snap ring that holds a a Belleville type of spring in place. Belleville or diaphragm, some people might call it, but it's just uh, concave or convex, depending on which side you're looking at. And then uh, the piston, which, yeah, you could see, yep, that metallic buildup. It's, uh, it just circulates through everything, even though the filter is in place. The filtration is not that small of a uh, micron size, so things, uh, metallic can pass through it, especially when the filter gets overwhelmed, uh, like it was in this unit. So here we are back at the foot press with the low reverse drum. Sometimes one little corner hangs up and gets bound up in there, but we got it. Off comes a low and reverse sprag. I don't think I've ever seen one of these fail yet. So after the low reverse sprag comes out, then uh, another Belleville spring and then the piston. And again, I like to use the floor to get this the low and reverse piston out. Slide you back over this way. And there it is. Uh, 
I'm not seeing much for metallic on it. So then we leave all these parts standing up so they can, so the oil can drain off of them and down into the trough of the bench and, and then into a bucket where we can save it for next winter because that's what we keep warm with is burning waste oil. So that's taken apart all the major components of the 6L80 except the valve body. We'll get to that here shortly. So here's the valve body and uh, I'm going to start with taking off the speed sensors. Set them aside to be cleaned. While it's laying this way, we might as well get all the screws on this side. There's, uh, there's bolts that hold the valve body together on both sides. So this brown uh, portion, this is called the TECM unit. The transmission control module is in here. And then all the solenoids are in here along with pressure switches. So if you have one solenoid that goes bad, when you buy that solenoid, you get an entire Tecum. So it's not cheap. So unfortunately, if one solenoid goes bad, you got to do the whole Tecum. A lot of shops might... Uh, sell a Tecum on every rebuild, but I, uh, here at my shop, I don't think that's necessary. Not until you get to maybe, in my opinion, 120,000 miles. Um, you know, after that, I think the, uh, there's a reasonable expectation that the Tecum um, might not continue to live a normal life after rebuild. Um, once you're, you know, over 120,000 miles on it. But, you know, if there's, uh, if there's uh, again, if there's solenoid codes or some other problem in the circuitry between these pressure switches and the computer, well, then you gotta, you gotta do a tech them because that's part of the fix. And this is the neutral safety switch or manual lever position sensor or whatever GM might call it. Everybody seems to have their own name for it, but it basically tells where the shifter or where the manual valve position is. So there's a little area here that you can pry and get the two halves separated. And one on this side as well. So then they come apart and that's one half of the valve body. And here's the separator plate which this should be the Yep, this is the latest design, what they would call a version 2, no, second generation version 2 is what they would call it. And it's got bonded, the, the gaskets on this are bonded, so they, you know, if you tear a gasket, um, you, you got to replace the plate. Uh, Unless you want to scrape the rest of the gaskets off, which is not a not real easy unless you can think ahead to set it in the hot tank overnight. But uh, I generally replace the separator plates. But 
So here's the check balls. It's got a nice little little white check ball and these things have been a nuisance uh, in the earlier years. I haven't I haven't seen a later model really act up where the check balls they bounce around in there so much that they get whittled down and and then start causing shifting concerns. And there's eight uh, eight check balls in this. After we dump them out here, you'll see there's seven plus the one over there. But um, so wear does occur in in certain valves in this valve body, and uh, we like to use a Transgo shift kit. And they have uh, two different kits, um, and we will put both kits in here, and uh, we've had great results. You know, we you, you do what these need, and, and you correct the root causes, like the pressure regulator valve being worn, and and uh, you know they, you you do what they need, and they they go down the road, and you you generally don't see them again. So that's about it. Everything's going to sit on the bench here and just kind of drip uh, until tomorrow when my rebuild kit arrives and then we'll start cleaning stuff up and and uh, get it get it put together as well as machining the bell housing. Actually, I might do that tonight. So what'll be a few minutes for me is going to be a few seconds for you so we'll uh, we'll get that going here So next we're on to uh, resurfacing the bell housing pump area right down in here where it's been scored up a little bit from the uh, metallic circulating through the pump and we're going to be doing that on the uh, Van Norman number 16s milling machine uh, not too long ago I made a fixture for the 6L80 6L90 bell housings and and uh, yeah, actually, looks like I made it in August 20th, 2021 for the 6L80, 6L90. And it uh, makes it real easy to get the bell corrected because uh, they're not always available from, from GM. And doing this, uh, uh, fixing these, uh, saves the customer some money and saves me time from chasing down another part. So let's uh, let's get it set up here. Okay, so I'm gonna make sure there's no no debris or burrs or excessive corrosion on the face of the bell when we set it on here. So this way it'll sit flat. So this fixture is mounted on a 12-inch Kernian Trekker rotary table. So 
So one of the first things we want to do is take the depth mic and and find uh, what uh, what the original depth is of the of the bell in an unworn area. And it's just below 709 on the on the mic. I don't know if that'll show up too well, but uh, so I would I'd figure it's probably 708 and maybe eight tenths or so. So we want to remember that number so we can try to target that. I you know somewhere in the 708 area as low as about 708 up to about 709 is where I generally try to target for uh, uh, setting the depth on this. So first thing we'll do is um, get it uh, brought up to the proper height where the, the cutter, the tip of the cutter, I don't know if you can see it, but it's right here. And it's um, this is a, a three inch fly cutter that uh, uh, has a carbide insert in it. And uh, sometime a long time ago, my, my father made that uh, fly cutter. So we get it almost to touch here. Might have to put a little light on there to see. Okay, so the next step, uh, now there's four f um, flats that, that come around. There's one over here, one over here, one back there, and one over there. And so we want to run it up right, right close to, to where those flats are. So this way we can get the whole surface. Okay, let's uh, turn it on. We're oh, we're running uh, two thousand one hundred ninety for the RPM uh, for this uh, carbide at a one and a half inch radius cutting aluminum. So I, it took me a little while to try and position the camera in a in a space that that uh, will be able to see stuff. But you know, there's not a lot of uh, working height on these Van Normans, um, so you know I got to keep a really short squat um, fly cutter, and then of course that's down in a pocket. So it's it's kind of hard to see, but but I think we're gonna get it here. So. Uh, uh, let me turn on the mill and uh, try to try to touch off to find a, a zero and and uh, probably add about maybe five thousandths, four or five thousandths for a depth of cut.
Yeah, they cleaned up pretty good. Pretty happy with that. And that was right about four to four and a half thou uh, cut. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna take that depth mic back out and uh, measure the depth there so we can verify what we're gonna try to target for a depth of cut on the channel surface up here. So while I was thinking we got about 4,000 step the cut, uh, it's looking like we we got um, about three, because it's at uh, 711 right now. So we're going to take three off the the channel surface and um, and and get it back to the uh, 708 range. All right. So the first thing we'll do is get it lined up under the cutter and then we'll we'll get it close having a little light behind it helps out quite a bit Yep, that uh, cutter tip's just, just touching. So here we go again. And if you're wondering why I'm not using coolant or spraying oil on it, well, this, this aluminum casting has been saturated in oils uh, in transmission fluid for about seven years now. So making uh, first cut, um, I, I don't feel I need to add oil. Uh, to the surface. All right, so let's take a another depth measurement here and see where we're at. Looks like about 708 and probably about 6 tenths, which is exactly where I like it. Maybe not exactly, but right in the range of exactly where I like. So we'll get this thing off of here and get it cleaned up in the washing machine. Sticks pretty good on those dowel pins. Those came out of a well, they came out of some GM engine block to transmission. All right, back to the washing machine. Get this 
Put down there so it's got more spray bar action. And uh, close it up. I give it about 10 15 minutes. Okay, now that we got the uh, bell housing side of the the pump done, um, we're gonna take out the hollow dowel pin, the alignment dowel, and uh, uh, one of the guys on my transmission forum told me to put a bolt in there, and that makes it a little easier to get this out. Because I'll tell you, this that little that little dowel is. Uh, can be quite a struggle to get out of there. It'll it'll crush if you if you're not careful. But I guess putting the bolt in there it tends to minimize that from happening. But so anyway, we're going to bring this over to the lathe and uh, and put a fresh surface on it. I like to hold this by the by the ring lands. This way, it's not on a, a polished surface where a bushing rides or or anything. And as long as you don't grip it too tight, it will uh, it, it won't bother the ring lands at all. And it allows that that surface to butt up against the face of the chuck jaws. Never leave the chuck key in the chuck, because you're going to forget it. Bring the uh, live center in, and uh, this way it supports the front. Uh, and the lathe we're working on is, a, uh, I think it's about a 1942 uh, Pratt & Whitney Model B. And the... Uh, the top speed on it's 525. It's not a fast mover, but it does everything I need to do in here. And and generally for a transmission shop, a 12-inch lathe is just just uh, just barely enough to to do what you need to do on it. Um, you know, for a lot of pumps, uh, some of the Ford pumps, which are a little bigger in diameter, you know, they uh, could just barely barely get it with the 12-inch. Uh, uh, lathe. So, uh, all right. Well, let's uh, start it up and and uh, get it going here. Let me change glasses here. Take off the reading glasses and put on the safety glasses. about 210 uh, it can probably go faster but eh, that'll be fine for as, as far as the radius needs to go on it and again this is another component that has oil soaking on it for seven years so um, to start we, we don't need any cutting fluid but, as you can see, this is all the way back, and we don't quite have enough uh, enough travel. So I got to reposition the <coughs> tool post. It's always good to do a dry run make sure that you can clear everything. I had a, a pump half the other day that uh, I got almost all the way in and couldn't do the last little bit. 
because uh, the outer diameter of the pump was going to hit the, the cross feed. But we're in good shape on this. Camera in a little bit better position here, and I think that's gonna it's gonna look it should look good. So here we go. Got to change direction of the power feed here. All right, now we got that there. Ready? Come in and just touch. Right. We'll call that zero. So now that we got our zero position on the, uh, the tool to the work, we're going to bring this in and gauge and kind of preload it about, uh, let's see, where are we at? Maybe right about 10. I really don't think it's going to take more than five, and so there we are. It preloaded on five on the on the dial. And then we'll move the carriage in to bring that down to zero. There we go. Okay. All right. So now that we got about five thousandths depth to cut. Run it in here. Okay, looks like we got a nice surface. The galling before it, it wasn't it wasn't atrocious. It wasn't the worst I've seen, but it was there. And you know, while uh, in a pinch, it it, it 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 could have been usable. Like I guess if you're stuck on the road and you got nothing else to choose, you know, you could have gone with it. But uh, uh, since we have a lathe. And we want to make things the best we can. And it was good to resurface it. Here we are at the parts washer. Since we're 
excess stuff always tends to hang out. to the small parts, the uh, drums and, and um, the pistons and such, uh, they'll all get put on this uh, Christmas tree. Okay, that looks like it for the uh, metallic sludge buildup. Almost. Sometimes a little pre-cleaning before it before it goes in. Well, that looks pretty good. See on these, uh, well, this is uh, the speed sensors for the 6L80, and uh, you can see when there's metallic floating around, there's metallic that gets on the on the magnetic speed sensors, and uh, I mean, these aren't absolutely terrible, but metallic can sometimes distort the signal of the speed sensor. So, like all other parts in here, we're gonna we're gonna get that cleaned up. Some of the parts that I don't like to put in the washing machine are the, uh, like the sprag assembly and bearings and the planetary gear set, of course, electrical components like the neutral safety switch. You know, being that that uses, uh, it's an aquinas or uses water with a, like a powdered solvent that goes in there or a detergent rather. Um, you know, it'll do a good job of cleaning the outside of this stuff, but it, it, it also tends to leave a soap residue. Um, and so we don't, we don't want that soap residue to get in and dry out and stay on these components inside the bearings, inside the planetary gears, inside the sprag assembly, or, or to get moisture or water inside here. We might not be able to get it cleaned back out. And then, you know, that, that leaves potential for some type of uh, failure or problem in the future that might spin you in circles wasting time. So best to do these things by hand right here and, and uh, in the solvent that will not create a problem with um, uh, moisture. A lot of these things clean up pretty quickly. You know, it's basically just rinsing off the metallic. The bearings never really seem to harbor a whole lot of metallic. So they, they do clean up pretty easy. And as we go together, I'm going to feel each each bearing and make sure that uh, you know there's no roughness to it that would signify it, it it's bad and needs to be replaced. But again, with this uh, transmission being such a low mileage, you know these bearings, I would suspect they're all in good shape. But we don't know for sure until that gets verified by testing them. It's 
about all you can really do with this is just kind of fill it up and spin it and try to put it through its motion a little bit. I, uh, I haven't seen any problems with these, even on the higher mileage units. Although I think uh, online I've seen some other people that have had a failed Sprag, but you know I think it's a pretty rugged part, this uh, low Sprag. Checking the planet, you always want to see if these rock at all. A little bit of end play this way and that way um, is not a problem, but when they rock, that means the inside's worn out or the pin, the pin that um, that these uh, gears ride, the planetary gears ride on, you know, that could be worn out as well. And you, know, you just want to spin them. You get to look at it pretty quick and. You know, if you, you spin it, your your eyes will pick out if there's one gouge that happens to be in, in a, a, a gear tooth. But these are in good shape, and and uh, it, it cleans up pretty easy. And if there's a little bit of mineral spirits residue left in there, um, it, it's not going to hurt anything. It's going to dry out. It's not going to leave uh, any, like the soap would, because uh, the soap can actually act as an abrasive. If you don't get that um, soap film washed off of the parts, and uh, and then so we don't want abrasive in there. And bad planetaries happen from time to time. You know we've seen it a few times. It's not real common, but it really only takes one bad bearing. Uh, a shrapnel from that that failed bearing to to go through and once it starts getting in this gear and it it dings up a tooth now that gear goes around and, it, and then it's uh, got a corresponding ding in this gear and a corresponding ding in the sun gear that's inside here and of course you got to replace the whole thing as an assembly but this one seems like it's in good shape Now, regardless of what they say about not using red rags to clean internal parts, engine parts, transmission parts, I haven't really found that to be true. Um, you know, you can, it, unless you're wiping off something that has a, a very, uh, like, jagged surface, and uh, then you can scrape off lint, but, uh, but any lint that does get onto these parts from here I I always rinse it off afterwards and it's it's never been a problem I you know never had to take apart another transmission later and found lint um, in the filter or anything like that it just you know I think uh, certain red rags like the, the type of material that jogging pants and sweatshirts are made out of um, that stuff tends to leave a lot of lint behind so if that's the the red rags that they were referring to, yeah, I could understand that, but the uh, the, the material that uh, the red rags we have is it just doesn't leave much lint, and it and it cleans easier than trying to use a bristle brush. Make sure to get all the soap out of where these pistons or rubber seals are going to ride in here. You know, we've seen it before where if these are left in the machine too long, uh, what happens is the, um, the water that's in here with the cleaning solvent actually gets a little acidic and it will etch the surface. And, you know, the transmission will work good for probably five, six months and then and then next thing you know, it's it's not air checking well, it's slipping, it's it's doing oddball stuff. 
and uh, and and that's just the uh, pistons not sealing the way they should because they get just uh, worn out from being on a, a rough surface. So this machine, this washing machine, is uh, made by CUDA, and uh, it's, a, it's a really good machine. I like it a lot. Um, I would say my favorite feature about this machine is the, um, the little basket in the bottom here that pulls out. Um, the whole upper tank flows through this to, uh, to get back to the sump. And uh, if you if you lose a clip or, or any little part goes uh, falls off of the case or or gets blown off the Christmas tree, it'll end up in here and it's easy to get. Other machines that I've worked with, it ends up somewhere down here in the sludge at the bottom, and uh, you know you might as well go to the shelf and look for a new one because chances are you might not find it in here, but. So while earlier I was saying uh, it's, it's best to keep things organized and when I take it apart I don't always you know lay things out because it's a common unit we we do them often um, but uh, as it's going together I like to lay things out like this in an, in an organized fashion and uh, you know it just it, it makes it easier. things together here. They're 
they're in good shape. There's no reason to change those. Okay, so some of these pistons were, you know, just a, uh, so you, you, well, there's, there's a little bit of soap residue, and that, that dries on there pretty good, and it'll, it'll act as abrasive against the rubber seal. So we're going to, we're going to take some sandpaper, like 600 grit, and uh, wipe that off of there. It was one of these that uh, I think it was this piston that had uh, had some marks in it that I want to smooth out just uh, to give the, uh, the rubber seal the best longevity. And you can feel it as uh, using this uh, fine paper like this. You can you can really feel if it's going over a rough surface and and uh, and if it's you know cutting off those high points because after you go around you know a full revolution and you start getting back to where you've already sanded it 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 really feels smooth. So that will make the difference of a transmission that, that goes a longer distance or one that's going to start having problems maybe within a year after the rebuild. And with what these rebuilds cost to do, you know, it's uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they it's a lot of money. You know, I mean, if I had to pay that amount of money personally, I, I would I'd want to go for the best job that's going to have the uh, good longevity in it. Matter of fact, I'm just going to do all of these. I think it. I think it just. It's that personal touch that goes into the job that uh, that could make it better. And it really only takes a couple minutes extra to do to do that The old saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And doing this is going to prevent a problem. You know, as, as, so w when you're going to fix a, a car, you want to find the root cause of the problem. Because if you don't find the root cause, you're going to have a repeat problem. And so we like to address the root causes to problems but not only that do a little extra and you know put a little prevention in there that will uh, prevent a, a new root cause from forming okay well it's almost 2 a.m 
So, when I leave here in a few minutes, <laughs> I'm gonna have to bring a really big pry bar home with me so my wife can use it to get me out of bed in the morning. But let's drop a few things together here. So I put the bearing in that goes between here and the case, and that bearing felt good. So we're gonna drop this in here. Well, maybe not drop, but set it in there. Well, that's not the bearing that goes there. I think I stuck it in the wrong spot. There we go. All right. Usually I put them in uh, as things are stacking up, instead of um, preloading them. It's always good to put a little bit of grease. Uh, I mean, well, that's quite a bit of grease, but. You know, just to do something so the bearing doesn't fall out of the way, because these um, this lip here, if it gets up on the edge and you drop something in on top of it and then bolt things down, it's going to end up uh, breaking the the bearing race. So try to keep them where they go, how they go. Okay, we're about ready to put this together at the. Uh, Transco shift kit, uh, new bonded pistons in those boxes, and down here in the bag, and new clutches. And uh, over behind me, we got the uh, rebuild kit. Okay, got you set up there for an overhead view. So. Lubricate all these O-rings that go in. And then around where the, the piston's gonna slide in the bore here. This is the first piston to go in. Anywhere that a rubber seal is going to come in contact, it, you always got to have it lubricated, even if it's just transmission fluid. Gotta be careful on this piston because there's one seal that's made to fit a different version of this and uh, you just gotta make sure to be using the correct one in the correct spot.
put all the pistons in since I have grease on my hands or trans gel on my hands. Might as well do all the pistons. Sometimes uh, I'll, I'll leave these seals on, let them go through the washing machine. So this way I can see that they are that they're there and it's not out of sight, out of mind when uh, when it comes to putting it together and then something getting you know, a seal like this getting forgotten. spot here and uh, it corresponds with right here I don't think it goes on any other way If you look real close, not sure if you can see that, but the rings, they, um, they're they cut at an angle. So you always want to keep the, the points where it comes to a point at the top. Um, some snap rings, it's very hard to see, but it does make a difference when, when, when trying to get snap ring pliers in there and getting a grip on them. Try that leg out of the way. There we go. Now if you get past, and there it is. Now, I like to use blue trans gel, not only because I'm a Ford guy, but if you use red trans gel and you Use it on your front pump, and, uh, and a little excess goes around the outside. What will happen is, when it gets hot, that will run down, and it will make it look like you got a leak out the front, and it's not transmission fluid. It's just uh, red trans gel. So to avoid any uh, mistakes, I like to use the blue or the gold. Or if you need the heavy stuff, they, uh, there's a, a green one that's really heavy. Really good for holding, holding needle bearings in place. I'm putting in this snap ring. Sometimes you need to shuffle around the, the Belleville spring because it'll sometimes get caught in the groove and the snap ring won't won't go in. Just got to make sure it's in the groove all the way around. I like to soak my clutches. Uh, some guys rebuild and put them in dry and, and that's okay as long as um, you can fill up the transmission and not enough with the uh, preliminary fill of fluid before it's started to let everything soak. Um, but I like to I like to soak them ahead of time and uh, and also we when we uh, do an installation, we, we like to put the uh, most amount of preliminary fluid 
in as possible. So this way everything's saturated good. So when I turn it over, I can lift up on the clutches and feel that it that it has enough clearance. What I, what I found is some of the clearances posted in uh, service manuals are not correct. They're too tight, and uh, these these do like to run a bit loose or on the loose side of any type of clearance. Um, and uh, and just going by feel, I can feel that it's that it's appropriate. So that's the low reverse clutch that's installed. And now on to the 2.6 clutch. This is the uh, wavy steel. It goes in first. If you can see it, it's it's wavy as it. Uh, it's a, it's a cushion. When the clutch applies, it takes up that waviness and uh, softens the shift a little bit. Without it, you would have a you could have a really harsh shift that uh, the normal person uh, would call uncomfortable. So again, you could probably see it here. The amount of clutch clearance that is uh, pretty normal for these. So we can install the drum now into the case. We got the bearing in place on top of the uh, planetary. That would correspond with this area here. And of course the these feed holes go at the six o'clock position. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we have the, the really big snap ring. And of course, the really big snap ring pliers to install it. Now one thing you'll notice on here is it is tapered. Uh, the bottom is flat and that goes down and it's, it's tapered on top and the tapered side goes up. One thing I like to do is make sure to tap it in to the groove so it's in there pretty solid. Some of the other components that could go in is this, um, I guess it's a uh, clutch hub for the 2.6 and of course we want to make sure that our bearings in place which it is and then just work it down into the clutches until it seats on the bearing and the next one's really easy oh and again there's a bearing in between these two components And then one more. We'll put that in. Of course, it's got a, a bearing, bearing in between there as well. This is the four, five, six drum. We're going to start with removing these old ceiling rings. I like to use a, a hook pick, if you can see. And uh, 
just to come in here and then just cut through it. And do all three. And then the rings come off. course comes with new rings and I still use the hook pick or continue to use the hook pick if you carefully go around you can work that down without stretching it too much sometimes you want to start one side and get it square in the groove They probably do have a sizing tool for this. I never got one, but if you're doing this at home, trying it on your own, you can use a hose clamp and just tighten that around to get it to size in to the groove. You just want to be careful that um, it doesn't it doesn't get out of the groove and that you squish it onto the flat or twist it or gouge it and you don't have to go especially tight with it just get it get it in there because if you go too tight then you start printing the um, the worm grooves onto the uh, ceiling ring which is uh, not really what you what you want because then it might not seal quite as well and now that these are they're in I like to put a little trans gel around them like that and then what we do is take the pump because that's where these rings go and make sure to test fit it and it'll also further size and so we got the first one but we want to make sure to get the second one and best thing to do is center the the ring groove or the rings in their grooves so this can slide on without cutting off an edge take it off and on a few times and, and that uh, tends to work them in to where now we have the confidence that when this all gets put together, these rings won't be sticking out and possibly get cut off during assembly. So we're going to apply some transgel around the inside where the seals ride here. And then of course to the the lip on the bonded piston. Put in the return spring. And then the balance piston. Now back to the clutch spring compressor so we can get the snap ring put in place.
back in the hole so it sits flat. We'll start with the wavy again. The wavy goes on top of the piston and then we put in a steel. And then a clutch and continue to alternate clutch and steel. Check the clutch clearance by feel, not measuring it, but that feels normal and what it should be. Now the next thing to do is drop this in place. We have to work it back and forth. So it engages all the clutches, which it did. And so now we know back where to where it goes when it's in. Putting some trans gel on here to hold this thrust washer in place. And then this planetary gear can go in. Not without the bearing first. Got to put the bearing. Anyway, so here goes the planet. And then the sun gear. Okay. Okay. Start putting together the one, two, three, four, three, five R clutches. We're going to start with a wavy. And then these all have to be lined up because the spaces between them also need to be lined up. Now, very important on this drum is, so it has grooves all the way around like normal for the snap ring, but there's one rib that does not have a groove and that's where the snap ring ends need to line up. And here's that groove right here, or the, uh, the rib that has no groove in it. So we're gonna put the snap ring in and uh, so this way it's seated all the way around because if you don't have the rib with no groove uh, between the snap ring ends, the snap ring will, well, if it stays in at all, it'll, it won't stay in for long. It'll pop out uh, of the rest of the groove. It'll just keep working its way out. So having those steels and, and uh, the spaces lined up is for this component which goes in to apply the clutches on top. So now we're ready to put them in. Okay, now this set also has one rib that does not have a snap ring groove. And it is opposite of, so if we turn this 180, now it's right here and uh, we'll get the snap ring put in where it's uh, in proper orientation uh, to the uh, rib with no groove and these both feel good for clearance so now that this drum is together we want to make sure that this bearing has a good seal as well. It matters because it's for the compensator feed circuit. Put a little bit of grease in here so these O-rings can go in without getting hung up. Now well, 
let's uh, do a little air checking, make sure that we don't have any leaks. That's good. That's good. That's good. And that's good as well. But again, it has this little bleed hole that uh, is supposed to be there. So if we cover that up, this thing will hold air for quite a long time. So now no worries putting, putting the drum in and putting the transmission in the truck. So we'll put the drum in and it can be, this one can be a little chore. And I believe they make special tools to do it. I haven't bought them. If, if I was doing a higher volume of these on a daily basis, I would I would certainly buy the tools. But with a little little finagling, a little persistence, it'll go down by hand. What we're going to start with here is uh, take this bushing driver. I'm going to take the bushing out of the center. Now it's got to start from this side and go down because there's a little tiny lip that will uh, get sheared off if you go the opposite way. There's the old bushing. And if you, if you look really close, you could see some embedded metallic in it. But we're, we wouldn't go back with it, not only because of that, well, actually a lot of embedded metallic, but we're putting in a new torque converter and, uh, and generally we want to have a, a, a new bushing to ride on the new torque converter hub. Okay. So here's a new bushing. I'm going to set it on there. And we start out with a bushing driver that's wider, not the one that fits inside because quite often it'll just split the bushing at its seam if we try to drive it with that. But we can finish the installation with the one that fits in. There it is. Looks good. Now while we're here, we'll put in the front seal. Being it's got a snap ring that holds it in, I like to put a little grease on the seal. around the outside of it and of course whether there's a snap ring or not or, or no matter what it is uh, you always got to lubricate the seal lip so this way you don't have a dry start on the seal and and cause the rubber to get uh, damaged but that seal will press in with your thumb and then you put in the snap ring to make sure it stays put. Also, I like to put a little trans gel on the, the bushing as well. Next step is the uh, assembly of the pump. We have a few new parts for that. So this big O-ring will go in here, and then this Teflon ring goes on top. 
And then this goes in here, but like that. So you could either grease this in place or put it in like that. And then we have the uh, little Teflon and uh, spacer, rubber spacer. For the pump slide. So once those are in place, then the pin can go in. And then the pump slide spring. which is, goes in pretty easy. So now what we do is take the pump rotor and the plastic guide and with a little grease, hold that in there. Put in one pump ring. And then 13 pump fangs. Now you can see it's got two two wear marks there where it was in contact, and I, I like to put them back the way they came out. So I'll put the face that has a witness mark that's all the way across. Of course, that goes back to the, the slide. And then the side that has a two goes towards the rings. It's just my preference. It probably wouldn't be a bad day if if they got put in opposite. You know, there's theory on things and then reality on things and and uh, reality is it's really certain things are just not that uh, not that critical. There's one more. It was hiding under the rag there. Okay. All right, so all the pump veins are in place. Now that top ring goes on. There it is. Okay. So what we want to do, some people pack the pump with grease. Uh, I never really did that. You know, even with uh, engine oil pumps, I don't pack them with grease. But we want to put a coating of uh, ATF on all these areas here so it's got some lubrication and doesn't start up dry. Clean it off a little bit. Now our shift kit from Transco comes with a new new pressure regulator valve. It's steel instead of the old aluminum one. and I really like Transco products. They make a lot of good stuff. So we're going to drop that valve in there. Not only is it made of steel, but the lands are longer, so it has a uh, more support area. Now make sure you look over the instructions and uh, to make sure not to leave anything out because that spring gets reused from the original. 
and they give you a new spring to to work with their valve but it does require two springs to be in there an inner and an outer spring that's a new boost valve that comes in the kit and they've designed it so it's got a pressure relief system built in and uh, so a little check ball goes in first and then the spring and then you put this cotter pin through there to hold it all together Might be time to get my reading glasses out. Okay, maybe not. I think we made it. Yep. So we got that. You got to be careful because there's a little valve inside this sleeve that'll fall out. But uh, so I take the pliers and make sure that that's in as far as it'll go, and then bend these around. All right, so now with the valve in place inside the sleeve, we can uh, get this put in. And there's a little retainer pin that should have been saved from before. And when this is all the way in, we'll be able to Let's see, what's... Let's see what's happening. The uh, head of the cotter pin was rubbing. All right, so that's together and ready to go on. Okay, so we're going to find where the dowel is. All right, so we're going to get this bell housing bolted on to the onto the case and uh, here it here it goes there it is it's always nice when there things go together without a hang-up Get all the bolts in place. And again, you know, there's there's some things that we uh, that I think it's critical that a torque wrench gets put on, but but these bolts, um, if you're familiarized with your your impact and and uh, have a good feel for it you know you can you can do quite a bit of this stuff without having to get out a torque wrench but if you if you're unsure or you have questions uh, or you're, you're really particular and want to get things exactly right then you know we'll then get out a torque wrench and uh, put the proper torque specs on it but again this is another thing that isn't really fussy so it uh, you know, we, we get away uh, with with doing it this way and, you know, it helps uh, with the efficiency a little bit and it's not something that'll cause a problem. So I've got my gun set on medium and that's, uh, this gun is, um, it's a really good gun and uh, puts out a lot of, a lot of torque in, uh, uh, in the max setting here. So we, I keep it on medium most of the time. Okay, let's see what we got. Uh, 
Yep, that feels good. Okay, what we'll do next is put on the uh, input shaft O-ring. Okay, so now we get to work on the valve body. Take these old seals out and uh, take a look at this and well we're basically we're gonna bring it over to the parts washer and get it cleaned up okay so we're just gonna rinse this out it doesn't have any varnish it doesn't have really much cake just some loose deposits of uh, metallic so it should clean up pretty easy So the first thing I like to do is put this part on because if it wasn't once, I don't think it was any more than twice, I forgot it. And these transmissions just don't like to work properly without that seal plate. So that's in place. Now here's another thing is the, uh, the shift kit. It comes with uh, new rubber and films here, but I um, it's kind of tedious to replace those on um, a, a Tecum that has more mileage. I will um, I'll replace them, but this one with 32,000 miles on it, you know, a, a lot of these components, you know, they have a, a lot of life left in them. So, so I'm not gonna take the time on this one to do it maybe uh maybe on a future um 6l80 or 90 i'll i'll uh i'll replace those on on camera but for now this is uh it'll get set aside and, and we'll we'll work on the uh the valve bodies here So this is a solenoid regulator valve uh, because the that's a, a valve that's prone to wear. You know, it's, it chances are with this this transmission, it's it's not going to be really worn. But we got the kit. We're going to put in the good parts and uh, should be smooth sailing. Valve goes in along with a spacer and a spring, and take a wide flat head, push it all in, and then this little forked uh, retainer will hold it all in place. There we go. And that's about all we do, except for you know, checking to make sure that we don't, even though I said, oh, I rarely see stuck valves in these. You know, it, you, don't, you don't know, you can't assume, and you don't know until you verify. So just using a, a small screwdriver here to, to kind of pick and, and move these valves. It doesn't move them their full travel, but it gives you an idea if they if they if they're moving with resistance or if they're moving free and also you know you get to see what's going on if there's any debris buildup that may have gotten missed during parts washing 
but all that is in good shape. So we have a couple more valves here. And I like to just try to keep everything lined up in a in a, an organized manner. Um, even though most uh, well these these springs are not going to get reused because um, the kit comes with new springs. And so Transco's got this second kit called the CSTCC and uh, I, I just use everything all together. Again, this low mileage unit, these valves are probably fine and they're going to work fine for a long time, but you know, I just, uh, I like doing both kits. As long as they go in and bounce out like that, they uh, they move pretty. Or I'm I'm happy with their their movement and how free they're running. And here's here's the new springs that go in, and then the spacers go back along with the retainers. Right, one more valve, and uh, it's this one here. Which is the torque converter clutch regulating valve. I mean, chances are the the torque converter clutch, um, it, it just failed on its own or some type of other failure inside the torque converter, but um, probably not due to any wear on this. I don't, I don't think it's really worn, but we do want to put in a, a more resilient valve. Okay, so now we get to put this stuff in the box to get it off the bench. So we don't look at it later and think we forgot something. And time for new check balls. These are a little bit better than the white ones that come in. They don't seem to get whittled down and beat up like the other ones. Okay, so I think that's how it goes. But that is one thing I like to verify, you know, unless it's a, just a really simple, simple thing, but. So there, there, there. Number eight, number seven, six, three, two. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight check balls in total because there are a lot of units and especially like Toyota's that there'll be a space for a check ball but there won't be a check ball and so it's 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 good to pay attention or you need to pay attention to where these things are gonna go and verifying it uh, is just the the sure way to put it together and, and have it work properly. Now again, I run them in, but I don't tighten them with the gun. Speed handle is pretty quick, but eh, 
it's not quite as quick as the gun. And I'm probably about 90 inch pounds or so on these. And just the method I've been doing is uh, what's been working for me. Okay, I'm gonna pull out the old shift shaft seal. And why I've had this tool, this was one of the first tools I bought. I uh, yeah, probably had this since 1992. Wow, these seals usually come right out. And there it is. Gotta love that northeast corrosion. Whew. Actually, no, you don't have to. I certainly don't. grease on the seal, a little trans gel around the outside. It's got a rubber, kind of a rubber foot, so I just use grease to, to put it in. And a little little seal driver. But if you don't have that seal driver, you could you could use the right size socket as long as the uh, part of the socket pushes around the outside of the the outside of the metal clad portion of the seal, you'll be in good shape and won't won't harm the seal that way. A little bit of grease on this, uh, it won't hurt. It can only help. It's always good to, to mark where these go, but the GMs go down, the shift linkage bolts here and comes down at an angle. Okay, got a couple roll pins to install. It's a really big roll pin and easy to get to, so we're going to just start it directly with the hammer. And you want to go until there's equal, equal stick out on both sides. There we go. And then the little roll pin that keeps the uh, end play or lateral movement. Okay, you don't want to overdrive that, otherwise there'll be nothing to grip onto to get it out. Okay, here's something that I like to do because I have seen these roll pins start walking out until they fall out. Uh, of the of the thing of, or they fall out and then now the rooster comb and the shaft won't uh, you know it won't it, well you, you won't be able to shift the uh, transmission so while I'm uh, not really the greatest at this my co-worker he's really good at this he used to be an aircraft mechanic and and uh, and he, I guess he had a lot of practice at doing these. I'll bring it back here to show you the pliers I'm using. But it, as you pull them, it's got that corkscrew up there that allows it to uh, spin the. 
spin the pliers. And so that's just a a method of uh, holding this pin in if it starts to walk. Now they, I've showed this before, and and people said, "Oh, you got to cut that pigtail off." I, I don't remember exactly what they're referring to, but we'll tuck this under here and Well, it's really it's not going to hurt anything All right, so well, I'll just leave it like that so I so so Gary my co-worker will come in and and uh, And he'll 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 just do a, a little bit better job than I can do with that but that's it's going to do what I want it to do which is uh, keep the roll pin from falling out if it ever got loose okay we're ready for the valve body we have this seal in place and the seals that correspond to these areas are on the valve body right here and here and we, you always want to make sure the neutral safety switch is engaged into the manual valve. I uh, did that to myself probably just a few months ago. Somehow it got put together and the manual uh, neutral safety was not fully engaged or it wasn't engaged in there. So we had to drop the pan and, and fix that. It wasn't a lot of work, but it was still rework. Switch over to the uh, speed handle here just to get a more accurate feel for uh, what we're tightening. A couple new o rings and seals on this bulkhead plug. And then, of course, like all the rubber components that have to engage into something else, they, they got to get some lubricant on, the, on them. And then also around in here, okay. So this, uh, this bulkhead connector is keyed. It'll only go in in one position. And then once, it, once you find that, you just push it in and then lock that down. That holds that in place. Still a little bit of grease left on my hands here, so use that to put on the filter neck, put the filter in place. We are getting close. A new elastomeric reusable pan gasket. And a clean pan. Well, still a little bit of a little bit of metallic on the magnet even after it went. Okay. Right here. Okay. And we Okay. 
So the coming into place. We close. New mess and reusable pain desk. And So a little bit of a magnet. You have to put the washing machine. Okay, let's go back, everyone. Let's go on. Let's go back. 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 And again, the gun is set on medium. If you put it on high, chances are you would. This gun moves pretty fast, and it's got a lot of pep, so it, it would probably uh, overstress the threads, or pull threads, or strip, or break a head off a bolt. While we're here, we'll take this thing off. Okay, just a little bit more. This uh, hanger works pretty good for the uh, for the other transmissions, the earlier ones, you know, like the 350 and 400 and 4L60 and even the 4L80 hang on it pretty good. But this thing is so offset; it's it's really um, it takes a bit of effort putting it in position sometimes, but it's still way more convenient than wrestling around with it on the on the bench or uh, trying to hang it or put it on a stand or something. I, this is where they all go for me. So we got the output seal to put in place. And again, got to lubricate those seal lips unless you want to have a leak uh, a little ways down the road. That's one of the things I like to do. I, I learned it at a, a shop that I worked at a long time ago. And uh, even though this has this rubber ring on it, I still like to put a little bit of Super Weather Strip adhesive around the, out of the, uh, the outside of the the metal clad part of the seal. I think there's possibly a couple benefits with it. You know, it, 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 it'll, it'll seal in a little scratch or something that uh, goes along where fluid could travel past and, and, you know, make saturation or a leak out the back. Um, and uh, in, in some seals it helps reinforce uh, how it gets held in there. didn't go too bad sometimes they're really it's like putting a cat in a bag sometimes they, they just don't want to go in and uh, but I, I found that if you're holding down one side of the seal and you you hit it at about a 45 degree angle not only does it push it down but it's also pushing it in for it to go past that lip and get that interference fit in there and, and that works out pretty good Sometimes it puts a little dent on the lip, but if you just go around and hammer that flat, it, it won't matter. No gasket. All the sealing is done back here. Now, on a two-wheel drive unit, these two holes here are going to be open for lubrication back to the splines for the uh, where the slip yoke goes on and, and a bushing that's back here that, that gets needs that lubrication you know on the four-wheel drive it's open back here 
and uh, you know so they plug these off there's nothing really there that that needs uh, any sufficient amount of lubrication beyond maybe a light coat of grease on the splines Now with uh, anything that has multiple bolts that holds it in place, you got to get them all started before you tight, tighten any one of them. Now I do have the gun turned up on this to the uh, high torque setting because we through the extension you're going to lose a little torque and then through the flex it's going to lose some torque and uh, plus these are they're, they're pretty heavy bolts so the by the time the the torque from this gun gets down here it'll be about the right amount for these bolts now we got to put in the, the dipstick to boot put a little grease in there so when he's my co-workers installing the, the transmission in the vehicle, the tube will slide in easily and it won't give him any problems. Okay, and into the bell housing. Always being I put a lot of effort in here. I always like to put my initials. And the date. Okay, I'm gonna call this one done. It is ready. We have a torque converter here waiting to be installed and uh, once we get this on the jack we'll put a nice coat of aluminum paint on there so it makes it bright and shiny I mean even though it's clean uh, the corrosion problem in the Northeast that it, the it doesn't look good it, it looks dull and and corroded so you know when somebody gets underneath the vehicle and they they look and they see something that's dull and corroded you know it um, what difference does it make on performance nothing really but you know part of somebody spending the money this amount of money on something that they don't want to spend money on because I can tell you there's nobody that comes in here and says boy I'd really love to spend three thousand dollars on my transmission today that just doesn't happen so you know if they get a when they get pick up their vehicle and they look underneath because they're curious about why why all this cost so much and they see this thing in there that's bright and shiny it looks new it's going to give them a good feeling and and you know that's that's what we what we're after is not only fixing their car but you know they, they can feel good about it as well they can feel like a visual. They might not have any idea what, what goes on inside of the trans, but they see it, it, it looks shiny and new. They're, they're going to feel good about it. So. so that's why we paint them. I don't charge anybody to paint them. We just paint them, and, and, um, and, and that's the, the look we want to have when we, we put all this work into a transmission and, and uh, put it in the car. You know, I, to me, that, it gives it a complete job. So now it's let's see what's that say 10:45 10:46 at night but we're ready for tomorrow to get this done and the, the customer can have their vehicle back for the weekend and after that well at some point I'm going to get the my transmission and somebody else's transmission and 
two more people's transmissions. Let's see. What do we have over here? Oh, on the other bench, we got a 6F140 out of a 2011 Ford F250 that's got a little pep built into it. About 200 horse over stock, maybe a little more. So that's going to get put together soon. Uh, here's the case for it. And here's another transmission that needs to get built. And another one. And another one. And if I keep looking, I'll find some more. Because uh, that's what we do. Is transmission work. Oh yeah, okay. So, didn't have to look too far. But here's another one under the bench. That's a winter project. And, well, being April... We're in uh, spring, so I guess I better get rolling on that pretty soon. Luckily, there's still some salt on the road, so he's not in a, a real hurry yet. But just got to keep him, keep him moving. Well, glad you could join me, or that I could join you, and uh, show you a little bit about what we're doing here. And, uh, you know, this is, this is daily work, the uh, transmission rebuilding, but we also do a lot of other things, machining, and, and, um, and maybe sometime I'll get a chance to work on some of my own cars here. Um, they, they certainly take up a lot of space in the shop, but uh, I like having them around. I like being in the shop. It uh, makes me feel good. It's got everything I like around here. And, uh, and maybe you like the machinery as well. So anyway, we're going to wrap this one up and, and think about what we're going to do next on uh, another video. Thanks and have a great evening.